My name is Mike Cadwell. I'm the director of the Knowlton School. And I'm very pleased to introduce this year's ARTA Award winners. Before I do, though, part of the, uh, the reason for these presentations is to encourage students to apply for next year. And uh, just a couple of pointers. <clears throat> Keep in mind that these, uh, even though it's called the Ar Architecture Research Travel Awards, it isn't specific to architecture. It's open to all three disciplines in the school and every level. So it can be undergraduate, it can be graduate, it can be architecture, landscape architecture, or city and regional plan. It's for independent travel, so it's not tied to an existing program has to be independent, and uh, research initiatives for up to 30 days. The deadline, as you can see on the, on the screen, is January 17th, and you can go to the ARTA page and download the application and more detailed instructions. Any questions about this? Uh, so this is, as will be testified to today, a great opportunity, and people should really make an effort to apply. trip in Tokyo, spending nine days there uh, before heading off to Hiroshima, spending a quick day. Um, three days in Kyoto, uh, and another three in Osaka before flying off to Seoul, spending another three and heading home. Uh, so just to give you a little brief history of about Tokyo, um, it hasn't always been the capital of, of Japan, it hasn't always been known as Tokyo, it was originally known as Edo, and Kyoto was the uh, one of the uh, previous capitals. Um, and it was also closed off from uh, the rest of the world for about 250 years ago until about eight, the 1860s. Um, and then it also has had a lot of destruction in the war um, and fire and natural disasters. So those were a few things that kind of intrigued us into Tokyo. Um, and then we were kind of wondering with the scale, uh, with this uh, city with such a large scale, kind of like what was that focal point? Because in a lot of European and American cities, you kind of get this grid um, or like a central spot that kind of kind of like, I guess, uh, you like focus on for like the origination. Um, and we kind of re really didn't get that at first. And then as we started to do a little more research and when we got to the city, we noticed that the palace grounds, um, which is the pink spot in the middle, um, was really that uh, origin uh, while you were in the city. Um, and then you can see in this, this is uh, the bombing raids uh, during World War II. Um, and in the center, there's a, uh, the palace is pretty much a void, um, but in this time, it was one of the few places that wasn't hit, um, so it became a solid within that. Uh, to continue off uh, what Greg said, uh, during our first few days in Tokyo, uh, we really started to see, uh, get a sense of that empty center space. Um, 
And you can see here, this is pretty much the only part of Tokyo City Center that you can access. And it's sort of this big empty lot, which is only used for, for demonstrations or sort of festivals. And um, another interesting thing is the surrounding context. Whereas um, Western cities, uh, Columbus is a great example, and you can see um, the main square downtown where the buildings um, it sort of all forms to the tallest in the center. Um, and you can see these, these diagrams here. So just to kind of add on to that, uh, this is a view from the Government Metropolitan Building on the 45th floor. And uh, as far as the eye can see, you don't really get a sense of what might be the downtown or the commercial district or the business district. Um, the heights of the buildings all, all vary the whole way out. Um, and then you can also see that as you're at a lower level, this is um, from the Tokyo Sky Tree about seven stories up, and you still get that same impression. Um, you never feel like there's like a real true city center or a commercial district. So when we were trying to find our way around, sort of relating back to the building heights, you can't, when you're on street level, really see sort of where you're going. Um, and you sort of, from your first impression, start to think this is a really chaotic place get me out of here. <laughs> and then, uh, this is from our first day, uh, the Tsukiji Fish Market, which is uh, sort of a, a place that a lot of Japanese people visit, uh, get their fresh food. And it really embodies the chaos of Tokyo. Um, just walking around there, even in the pedestrian designated zones, there's, as you can see in this picture, all forms of transportation going in every which way. Um, and you're really not safe wherever you go. <laughs> And it's kind of overwhelming. And this photo is from uh, the electric, they call it Electric Street in Shin, Shinjuku, which is uh, where they sell a lot of uh, electronic uh, sort of stuff. And it's sort of an example of another thing that's really prominent, prominent in uh, Tokyo. It's sort of a, a visual overload, um, sort of a sensory uh, thing. And it's just bombarding and quite overwhelming uh, to a first time visitor. And then once we <laughs> got used to that, uh, we realized that even crossing the street is sort of a, a chaotic thing in Tokyo. This is uh, Shibuya Crossing, which is the busiest intersection in the world, and it's sort of Tokyo's Times Square. And so, after we were done walking, uh, we finally got tired and decided to ride the subway. We realized we had to, to navigate through this. Uh, I think there's, but there's over 102 different uh, train lines in Tokyo. So basically what we were able to come up with is that Tokyo is an organized chaos, um, but it demands respect and attention. So there is a system to it, um, it is navigable, um, the people that live there are used to it, um, but it just, I mean, it takes a little more effort, I guess, than uh, here in the U.S. Right. And to start to compare Tokyo to the western uh, city, um, the first thing that you start to notice when you're there is that it definitely lacks a street grid, um, and you can see this not only uh, from the street level, but from a map. This is near the Imperial Palace, so the city center. And you start to notice that it's not really all the roads lead towards the center of the city. Um, they're sort of going in all different directions. Um, and you compare this to the grids in New York, how they're, they're extremely easy to navigate and find your way around, especially with the, uh, something such as the numbered streets. Um, they really sort of help you gain a sense of place in the city. Uh, and then another thing uh, that we kind of that we noticed and we focused on was uh, the building facade as a sign. Uh, with real estate being so expensive, um, the building facades uh, definitely take up a large portion of that, and they're used more for advertising as opposed to administration um, or for windows. Uh, this billboard kind of gives you a scale of that with the lady standing in front just to kind of give you to, just to show you like just how big this is. That's about two stories. And then um, this one, uh, we particularly like the Sega building um, because it started to call out the circulation, uh, whereas um, a lot of times I've kind of hidden. Um, but in this example, um, it's really called out and starts to give uh, the escalators uh, a sense of uh, three dimension as opposed to two dimension when you read it in elevation or plan. Um, and it's kind of starting to pull off the building um, and become both circulation and advertisement for the building. The signs are definitely something that, that come alive at night, and it's sort of one of the great characteristics of Tokyo, and particularly a lot of Asian cities as well. 
in the sense that you sort of have this Times Square atmosphere um, in all places of the city. It's not really centralized in one place. And so obviously while we were there, uh, we wanted to see a lot of the great architecture um, of Tokyo, uh, particularly a lot of the ones that are uh, unique to uh, Japan. Uh, metabolis metabolism, which is a huge thing uh, in Japanese architectural history. And we also noticed, though, that there's a lot of Western influence um, from both sides. And we made a point to see a lot of Western architecture as well. And then after Tokyo, uh, we went to Hiroshima for a day. And it was kind of just to compare uh, after the war uh, all the devastation that happened, what, uh, to, like the, how they've been able to regrow from that, um, seeing as we were interested in uh, the fact that it was destroyed and just decimated, um, and kind of how they've been able to rebuild since that time. So we went to the A-bomb peace dome, and uh, we went to the peace memorial um, just to kind of see what they've been able to do um, since then. And our next stop uh, was Kyoto, which was sort of a nice uh, contrast of Tokyo in the sense that, first of all, it's it's not a, a standard Japanese city. It's modeled after a, a Chinese city. And so it has a street grid, and it's, it's not near as overwhelming uh, on your first visit as Tokyo. It's much more spaced out. There's a lot more um, room for things. And you can, you can see here, uh, there's there's not the, the commercial type of stuff that you see in Tokyo. It's it was the, um, the capital of Japan before Tokyo, and you start to see a lot of the um, cultural things. Um, some of the most famous temples and shrines of Japan are present here. And then our last city in uh, Japan that we went to was Osaka, and one of the big things that we picked up here uh, was how we were talking about the building facades in Tokyo. Um, how this kind of made it just one step further, um, where here a lot of them are three-dimensional and start actually popping off the buildings. Um, and some of them even start to move in, um, like the crab here on the right, they start to move. So it's kind of just an extra dimension that's taking it one step further. Uh, and then the deer in the picture, if you're wondering, uh, there's a story in Nara that a god, a god is written on a deer and so they're worshipped. And so uh, they're just all over the city, there's a couple hundred of them. And you can go up and pet them and feed them. So it was just an interesting thing that we got to do while we were there. Uh, it was also great sort of to see some entertaining uh, cultural differences, such as the bad uh, translations, as well as this is particularly my favorite school photo of Nara. <laughs> <laughs> and then while we were there, we also got to interact with a lot of people. Um, a lot of the school children are trying to learn English, so they would approach us at a lot of the major temples. Um, this is at the airport in Seoul. And then we also got uh, some of the uh, older people who were trying to work on their English as well. So they would come up to us and they would give us free tours of their city or uh, of the area. So they got, they, we both mutually benefited because we didn't really understand a lot of Japanese. Um, and they were able to kind of translate and show us around and make it much easier for us to learn and navigate, just to have a much better overall experience. And I think definitely uh, one of the greatest things about the Arda is um, being able to travel uh, sort of away from the big uh, KSA group and sort of being able to interact with a lot of the locals and sort of being in these youth hostels, which we stayed in. Um, there's people represented from like four different continents in this photo, and it's great just being able to get the, the opinions uh, and experiences, being able to, to share your experience in Japan with people from all over the world. So, arigato, which is thank you in Japanese, so, thank you. Hi guys, uh, my name is Nikki Espinosa, and as you can see, my uh, art presentation is entitled Retracing Lucan's Tour of Scottish Castles. Uh, some of you may know that I'm a big Khan fan. <laughs> Khan is the answer. Uh, and uh, actually, I should say now, I did this uh, pro or project with um, Luke Anderson, and unfortunately, he uh, is unable to, to come. He's still in New Haven right now, doing his uh, master's at Yale. So 
I'll start off with just some pictures from the trip. Scotland's a really beautiful country. We went, though, during what's the worst winter they've had in 30 years. <laughs> but you know what? I'm from Cleveland, so it's really nice. <laughs> I'm used to it. But here you can see the castles. You can see uh, really the sea line or the seaboard. And this is Aberdeen on the bottom. And really just a lot of stone. Throughout my presentation, you're going to see how that translates into the, the architecture of the Scottish castle. So. so why did we choose Scotland? Um, we were really interested in, in the idea of organizing a plan. Like for us, that's the fundamental start, starting point for any architectural design, is like how you begin to organize program uh, to meet term, or to meet like lighting requirements, and, and kind of for uh, circulation pathways and, and everything. And we think it's really, uh, it translates very well <laughs> into good architectural design is having an organized uh, And more importantly, we wanted to start to understand this relationship between served and servant spaces, which Khan often discussed in, in his writings. Uh, we, were, we didn't really know what they were, but, but through the, the castles you can kind of get a better understanding of what he meant by certain certain spaces. And we wanted to see how these, uh, these designs influence Khan. So we would try and uh, establish relationships between uh, Khan's designs and the designs of the castle. So I'll start um, with this slide. And I want to say that I think these two buildings, both uh, Kamagan Castle and the First Unitarian Church, are doing the same thing. And you might ask, like, how can a building from the 15th century of Scotland be achieving the same thing that was built 500 years later? And you can look at it now, but hopefully throughout this presentation, I'll be able to give you a better understanding of why they're doing the same thing and what it is that they're doing. So here's a brief history of Scottish castles. Um, from the first century AD, you had your first major stone structures called brogues. Uh, they were about 40 feet high and up to 40 feet in diameter with a 20 foot thick stone push in wall. And uh, there was no windows. They were impenetrable fortresses and they were actually, um, you couldn't even smoke them out. They were, they were really great in terms of defense and you know, strategies. And then after the Norman uh, invasion of uh, William the Conqueror, you start to see what are called Moton Bailey castles, uh, which are the second ones here. And those were, they used wood construction, and they just kind of built a, a large palisade around a moat, and they would build up tons and tons of earth. So you can see, this is where they would build up a ton of earth, and they would put their, um, they would put their little king's lair there. And this whole thing, this whole world, uh, shell is, is just uh, protected. But then you get in the 14th century and the 13th century, actually, too, you get the first, like, what you would consider a stone <coughs> castle. And these were called curtain wall castles. And what they would do is they would take uh, a piece of land that was similar to a peninsula or, or a promontory, and they would use the natural kind of defensive cliffside of, of that promontory, and they would build a wall uh, where that connected to the land. And that would be their strategy, was just to use this super thick poche wall as a, as a, a, a border, you know, a defensive border. And then as the technology got better, you get the tower house castles, uh, which were able to stand in open land. They were able to construction, the technology allowed the castle to defend itself without the use of the natural surroundings. So I'll stop boring you with these and we'll start to look at some real castles. This is Tenslin Castle, which was built in the 14th century by the Red Douglas Earl Spangs. And this is a curtain wall castle. And you can see the super thick wall. It's almost like a straight line, because behind it is, is a peninsula that is surrounded by cliffs. Um, here you can see the first picture is of uh, the moats that line the front of the castle. And here on the, on the right is just another example of why, like, how you can see the curtain wall. It's just a very straight, straight line. Here's the cliff side behind it, with the foreground being of the, um, the, the Earl's actual personal wing of the castle. And you can see the super thick walls 
and the, the vaulting that's done to support it. This is the this is where you really start to see how they work with the crochet. I think if you look at the bottom right picture, you see how all these about the fireplaces are carved out, you know, right over the wall. And you get to nestle in that space and occupy it. Here's the plan of it though. So as you can see in the foreground in the, in the front, there's uh, the big the big curtain wall, which uh, is uh, nestling both staircases and circulation paths as well as chambers and gun rooms and and, the, and also the the kind of battle stations because this is where they fight. And then on the opposite side, there's the sea gate, and you have in the middle an open courtyard. So you can see the site strategy here, how they uh, use the site to kind of enhance this, the protective nature of the castle. But then you start to wonder, well, why did they do, why did they put the program that they did in the castle? And you see that um, they had to worry about structure as much as anything because um, the the structural integrity of the castle is the, the fundamental, most important thing that they, they, they needed to survive. So, so you choose the, the thinnest program you can, you put it at the bottom. This is how they start to organize the program. Um, so that you can have the thickest you know, load-bearing wall at the bottom. So the stairs are always at the bottom with uh, the more open spaces at the top, where you get your chambers and your gun chamber. This is Donater Castle, which is a 14th century castle built by William Keith. Who's later the Earl of uh, Marischal. And this is a really beautiful castle. You can see how it's on its own almost island that's just connected by one little strip of land to the, to the coast of Scotland. And here you see how they really build into the mountain. And the heavy stone really kind of has an aesthetic appeal that matches the, the mountains. And these are really cool. You see, it, it's almost uh, disorienting being in this castle because you have doorways that you, you don't really know where they go, but they're all right next to each other. It turns out that the door on the left is leads you to the vertical circulation uh, path. The door on the right leads you to a little kitchen, or excuse me, the door in the middle leads you to a kitchen, and the door on the right is storage. So essentially, um, I'll show you some more pictures and then I'll show you the plan to make one sense of it. You have what's your main space, which always seems to be a very rectilinear space, you know, this, this interior square. And then you have your exterior crochet that has all these programs nestled in it. So this tends to be the, the reoccurring theme in all the castles. And at the end, when I reference it to Khan, it should make a little bit more sense about you know, what's really going on. So this is the last castle that I'm going to show. This is Derlington Castle, which is a 13th century castle um, in North Barrick. Um, here's the, the main dining hall here, and you can really start to get an idea of layers, you know, and, and carving out of the stone. And you see, like, through and through between all the interior windows and whatnot. And here, more layers. And now, you start to understand by looking at these pictures that, that there's a ton of activity going on inside of the walls. And this, um, is really functioning activity. So you would have, in this space, you would have a ton of you know guests eating in the royal, the royal dining hall. But in these little spaces, you would have tons of little slave workers uh, cooking and cleaning and running around delivering food. And, and essentially, the organization of these spaces becomes very interesting. So I think th that's most visible in the main vault where they stored all the food and they had the kitchen. So this is that space. And then, if you see this little hole right here, normally you'd think that this was a, a solid wall, but it's not. It, this hole allows you to see into another space that was used to transport um, food from this space to the kitchen. So you really start to find ways of, or these, these designers um, used ways of hiding and masking these programs that were really important to the, the function of the castle inside of these really thick walls and, and they were able to uh, conceal all the things that they didn't want people to see. So this is the kitchen. Again. And this is uh, one of the 
completely deteriorated staircases, and on the right you have the dovecot of the castle, which is typical. So here's the floor plan, the first floor and the ground floor. And you can see here that um, they kind of, as the castle turns, which was part of the design, they decided to nestle um, all that servant space inside of the, the corner of the turn. And you can see that here in the, in the bottom. And here's the main vault, and here's the kitchen above it, and the great hall. So you start to see where, where the access points are between the kitchen and the main hall, or the kitchen and the um, vault. So what is the relationship to Khan? How does this uh, you know, inform Khan's architecture? And there's a number of things. I mean, if you look at a building like the National Assembly in Dhaka, uh, you can clearly see the resemblance to the Scottish castles with the, the large towers in the front and this, the stone aesthetic, the almost minimal kind of fortress-like appearance with, with thin windows that are articulately placed to light. Like but more importantly, I think working with the issue of Pochet, this is where you really start to see the influence of the castles. So as you can see in the top picture, here's Luke um, sitting in a little bench, which is carved out of the wall of Tintown Castle. And if you look at the diagram to the right, you see how, how that works. Really, they just carved out benches and a window out of like a 10-foot big wall. And what Khan does in the Fisher House is actually very simple. Um, he uses a super thin piece of glass as his crochet, which is interesting, you know, because obviously in modern times you don't have the, the cost or the materials to work with a 10 foot thick wall. So he takes a super thin piece of glass and he starts to, to kind of bend it and make these recessed windows, which, as you can see here, if he puts a seat, is achieving a very similar effect as, as Tintalon Castle, because these little recessed pocket windows, you can open them and it gives you a little landing to, to put things in and, and it allows you to open windows in, in times of storm. So it's this kind of like a very human, very protective um, atmosphere uh, with a very thin wall that is um, very similar to the atmosphere of being inside of this extremely thick pusher. And then there's the idea of the one room building. So as I showed you in that uh, one of the earlier slides of Kamagan Castle. You can see, and, and also in the, the Donata Castle that I showed, um, the castles typically have a, re a rectilinear form with a main rectilinear room in the middle. And that's what is considered the one room building. You know, no matter what's going on in this poche, it always has the atmosphere of having that one large room that, that um, kind of holds more authority. And if you take the outline of this space, including the, the servant spaces that are inside the poche, you start to see a lot of similarities between that and some of Khan's designs, like the Urban Hall dormitories and the First Unitarian Church, where you have one you know, central room, and then you have all these other servant spaces that are, that are enclosing it. And they're, they're really creating this centralized plan that uses the wall as a room. You know, it's, it's like using spaces to make poche where poche didn't really exist before and you have uh, really nice it, it's incredible you know the way you can light these rooms from above and, and you create this protective atmosphere defense like a shelter atmosphere so that's really um, i think the most uh, the best analysis i could give of of how these scottish castles begin to inform kind architecture I hope that that was somewhat important. <laughs> <laughs>
And one of the things that we def we did in our trip is that we split it off in mostly four big sections, more well known. So you have your Sultanahmet, which is down there, and then across the Golden Horn you have Bedeglu, then to Levent, and to um, Anatolia, the Asian side. And we kind of travel within all four of those to find our own way. And now we have a little video to show you to represent like the connectivity or the disconnect of actual like transportation systems. Shift in what is a different type of city center. 
And in Bengaluru, it was actually in the fifth century it was established. It was established in the European front. And in, after the Ottomans took over, it was actually given to the Venetians as this European control center. So while you're walking down the streets, you have this neoclassical, you, ha you have all these Art Nouveau architectures surrounding this, that is a complete only across the Golden Horn from Totonabek. So you have this big shift of both Ottoman, Ottoman architecture and you have a more European style architecture. And this also becomes a center of arts and entertainment. And this also is a center where later on in the 19th century, when there was a lot of turmoil in, it, in Turkey, you start having this, um, these big problems between what is the Europeans and what do the Ottomans want. The Europeans are want progress. The second subway line of the world was built in Istanbul, in this side. While the other side, as Sultanaman, they still didn't even have electricity. But this side already had a subway system. So you also see in a difference of what is tradition and what is and what is considered to be more modern. So this becomes the arts and entertainment center. And it's interesting because it's a huge, this is just across the river, it's already a huge difference of what type of style it is. So in our efforts to get as diverse a look at the city as we can, um, in an indirect comparison to the heavy tourist area of Sultan Ahmed, and the, the heavy commercial and art district of basically we spent a lot of time in Anatolia, which is just across the Bosphorus Strait, um, a ferry ride away. <clears throat> and what also, it's on the continent of Asia, and so that makes Istanbul an intercontinental city, which is one of the few in the world. Um, Anatolia is the oldest established residential neighborhoods um, of the city. And currently, it has a, a, a wide mix of lower um, to upper class population, but it's very heavy, very densely populated, and it kind of has more of a blue collar feel. Um, it's it's really known as the modest alternative in terms of nightlife, shopping, etc. To Beige Blue, um, what Stephanie just talked about, and I guess. What, we spent the least amount of time on this side, probably a few days in total, and you really just get more of a laid back, less chaotic feel than you do in in the in the areas that we previously spent time. And so, if Anatolia is the older, uh, more laid back residential side of it, the district of the city. Um, the direct contrasting area would be Levent. And this is the northernmost part, the smallest, also the smallest circle that was on our um, opening map. This is really the main business district of the city. It, uh, as Stephanie pointed out, with the decline, the earlier decline of the Beja Blue area, um, so came about a push for development in this area. Um, it's really the home of the, the home of biz, the business center, um, high-end shopping and dining, and all the modern architecture. This was the first time, our, our first trip here, we really noticed the high volume of construction going on. There was probably eight or ten large you know, skyscraper buildings being built um, just when we were there, which is pretty rare. You don't usually see that too much around <clears throat> around here. Um, this building is the currently the tallest building in Istanbul, the Istanbul Sapphire. I think it's it's really only about 54 floors, maybe 80, 70 something. But that's not very tall. And it's one of the few steel constructed um, buildings in the in the whole country. Um, concrete construction is much more prevalent. And the, the picture on the right is a view from the top, from the observation deck of this tower. So we got the earlier photo. You can really see the sprawling metropolis. And as well, in the foreground, major construction uh, going on in this area. Um, and so the, through these comparisons of, of the four districts, we're really trying to convey the extreme differences that come about throughout this massive city. Um, and, and how that relates back to our initial hypothesis.
So initially we assumed that because of the clashing of cultures, we're going to have different types of city centers. People settle in different areas, people travel, and the fact that you have, it's the main port of the Silk Road. Uh, but we didn't expect it to be that varied. And I think and we concluded while we were there that maybe a lot of it has to deal with how difficult it is to travel. So within Istanbul, which is the largest out of all these five cities, at 700 square feet, London is a 600, Rio is a 460, Hong Kong at 450, and New York City at um, roughly around the uh, 300 actually, 300 square feet for its central area, not its metro. For 700 square feet at its highest, it only has roughly about, it, it doesn't, 1.5? 1.5. Oh, percent of green space. Um, but yeah, but a lot of it to deal with transportation of miles. Comparison to, let's say, New York City or London, the miles of track of annual ridership within Istanbul is actually relatively small. Same with the population of travel. There's this lack of actual public transportation that makes it difficult to connect to actually different parts of the city. So which allows for it to actually be its own different centers and be more individual in its different city centers and different architecture, because you lack this connectivity. And we noticed this when we were traveling, like sometimes okay, so it's extremely difficult to get to one point or the other. There will be no subway lines, there's actually no displayed bus routes that you can actually follow. And it becomes, if you don't have a car, it becomes really difficult to travel within a city. And in comparison to like, let's say New York City, it's huge. The huge difference between, and, it's, and New York City is half the size of this um, We also were talking, we were there right before the riots. And right before the taxi protest, which dealt with green space. So during these riots, a lot of people were complaining the fact that urban developers were actually going to take Gessie Park and make it into a more westernized area by putting a mall. And if you can see, if you can't actually see it, though it's too washed out, but Istanbul in its entire 700 square feet, only 1% of that is green space. In London, it's 40%. Rio de Janeiro is 60%. Hong Kong is 40 and New York City is 30 it's 1% of its entire square feet, and that was the main riot for focus point of the riots. It's, we don't have space, but also this idea of westernization. So one thing we discovered by go, we also traveled to Ankara, its capital, and one thing we discovered while we were traveling to both these places is, what is westernization done? And what is, why is Istanbul more western, and why is Ankara more eastern or more Turkish? And it becomes this idea of, you're connecting these different forms together, you're connecting it's, become, it's a port city, you have more a cultural exchange, but also because of the Republic of Turkey and after the Ottomans left, Ankara became the center of Turkish identity and this, Tur this center of what it meant to be Turkish and they pushed away from the Ottoman past. So Istanbul, its sites became tourist areas and it became this place of exchange instead of what is to be Turkish. And that also can be seen in the riots where a lot of it was like, no, but I want to be Turkish. And well, you have this push for westernization and this limited green space, so we're, how do you balance it? And it was, a, it was a thing that we were constantly seeing. It was like, we will run into people, they're like, yes, we are Turkish and those other, and at the same time, the, we'll, hear, we'll hear like Macklemore Trip Shop at every place we went. So it's one of those things where we're definitely, and that we also got us thinking of, what is the modern day Silk Road? So Istanbul is known for its Silk Road, it's where it's done. But the modern Islam road isn't tangible, it's the internet. It's this intangible source of information and culture and we don't have, no longer have these physical artifacts. Now they're becoming music, they're becoming movies. And how is that affecting these larger cities that have a larger connection to the internet, to digitization, and how is it affecting the city format overall? So that was one of our leading conclusions at the end that we were thinking of what is going, what's going to happen now to the world? What is this globalization with this new intangible silk road? There's no longer just, just one road that connects to the Middle East to Europe. It's the entire web network. And how, what is the goods that are being traded? It's ideas. And how do these ideas are constantly changing and constantly being readapted to different cultures? So, thanks. <laughs>
looked at as mainly just skin. So we decided to go look at the works of Gaudi and Borromini and look at how um, a thicker surface or just surface in general affects the space um, that it creates. Uh, so this is Borromini's uh, San Carlo al Quattro Fontaine. Um, and our argument with this is that uh, is that in such a tight border, it really uh, begins to imply this infinite space through its surface. So this is its dome, and you can see that uh, the coffering of the dome kind of uh, settles behind the ornament that lines it. Uh, you can kind of see right there. So you get you never. Uh, see where the pieces touch the ground or begin to settle, so it's these infinite vanishing points. And, and it's also in all the apses, so this is the entrance. And you can kind of see that the coffering is broken up by a window that kind of fades out into space, and then the pediment is also uh, vanishing into the cornice of the, the chapel. So you get that uh, in all the apses where things start to fade away and they could go on forever, but they don't. They just there's this layering effect. Uh, you get these in the, with different motifs. This is a these are layered shells, and you get these all over Rome. Uh, but you can see how things layer up, and then again. Uh, so you can see it in section where things start to overlap uh, up in the dome. Here are the side apps with the pediments and the coffering. Um, and it's also in plan, so in plan it really wants to bulge out, wants to expand, but it's really uh, confined into this space. And down in the chapter room, uh, you'll also get this. So this is going down, uh, downstairs. So. Uh, there's this little spiral staircase where they're going around these two windows. One's into chapter room, the other is into a little side room. Um, this is that side room. So beyond this uh, is the staircase, but it wraps around so you get this oblique surface where uh, you don't see what's on the other side. So it has this implied infinity and also at the, uh, another little side room where you get these layers of space and at the end point you get a little staircase that wraps around and you don't see the end point. Um, this is the in the Vatican Museum. Uh, really interesting thing where you're entering into this uh, space uh, on center and then the room beyond uh, the space is off center to that room so as a result uh, this is where the picture was taken down here, and then this is the uh, room beyond. As a result, we get these two uh, arches that are lofted together, and we get this really warped uh, coffering. So this is it on the other side. Uh, so this is on center with everything else in this room, where, whereas it's not on center with the uh, room that you initially entered. Um, this is Borromini's uh, Propaganda Fide, where he initially designed the facade first, uh, and then some of his interior designs were not realized, so as a result, things also are kind of lofted into each other. Um, it's blurry because we were the only people in there, and the guide was following us, and we were not allowed to take pictures. So, um, so from afar, it looks like it's very straight on, but as you begin to approach, it, it's at an oblique and you can see that it uh, bends back enough that there's actually a doorway there. Um, and here's another little room where uh, the windows match the, are centered based on the facade but are not with the room. So as a result, you can see up here that the space carves away and uh, acts on the center to this. Uh, and here is the chapel in Propaganda Fide. And you can begin to see where uh, basically the windows and uh, the surfaces of the space uh, start to intersect one another. So he had a really 
clear understanding of how to intersect spaces, and uh, whereas something similar, this is uh, um, Santa Maria, Santa Maza, and then there's Zata, and it's a small little Baroque church uh, along the river bend. But you can see how uh, the bullions of the windows intersect the beams of the um, so, so Warren Meeting had a really good understanding of how to manipulate the surface. Um, another little chapel is uh, Vermonte's uh, Santa Maria de la Pace, where uh, you're entering, uh, you get to see the church at Oblique, but when you get to it, it's a very symmetrical facade. Um, on the left, you have an uh, entrance into a museum and then middle entrance to church, but on the right, you actually enter, you go through the facade of the building and it connects to another street. So you're moving through the thickness of the surface. Um, something else that is really, really interesting and kind of deceiving at the same time is uh, this building in Piazza uh, San Ignazio, um, where it reads as one building, but in reality it's uh, two island buildings with uh, fake facades on other buildings, so you can see this in the axon, where these two buildings are separate and uh, spaces are carved, or roads are carved around behind them, and at the corners you get this kind of unified shared space that um, curved surfaces kind of start to unify. Um, this is um, Borromini's uh, uh, Capitan Archives. Uh, this is the, this was a really interesting thing because it's a courtyard that um, reads as one, but we argued that it was really two different courtyards. Um, So this is um, that courtyard, and our argument is that really the main courtyard, it begins to break itself down by uh, use of different types of pavers, um, the way that those pavers are elevated, and then the way that the columns and surfaces are manipulated. So you can see here um, that uh, this corner and this corner have these uh, concave columns that address uh, this main kind of port, but then it extends into this one where you can almost read it as this is a part, this port is part of this because uh, the arcade starts to wrap the corner and there's this kind of uh, continuation of surface. But as you start to look up, you can see that the corner is actually revealed. So here's the diagram of it. Um, and you can see that just the, by use of proportions, this is the colonnade on the uh, right side of the image that I just showed you, and this is that little elevated part. So really, this little elevated part could read as uh, like a naked colonnade. Um, now to Barcelona. This is a uh, royal palace by, Bormi, or by Gaudi. This is one of his earlier works. This is a ceiling that was really interesting, uh, just by its sense, like the amount of detail and depth that it has. But um, the ceiling, it does more than just looks good. Um, it really uh, matches kind of the proportion of the room that you just came into or came from. So uh, the room that the ceiling's in is actually larger than the room that uh, the couch. So you can see, this is the room you come from, this is where the ceiling is, the side line. So it matches the kind of boundary of the first room. But the interesting thing is how this wall gets rid of the corner by its subtle curve. So it's like a backdrop of a, like a studio photography. Um, so it kind of vanishes and it acts almost as a, a false perspective bringing the wall closer to you. Um, this is Gaudi's uh, Park Well. Um, really uh, deals with kind of double-sidedness of surface. So on one side you have seating, 
or on the other side, it's basically a mirrored surface. You have uh, basically a gutter system, and you can see how the water uh, drains down behind these little bumps and then out. Uh, and also, the, the surface, uh, basically these benches follow uh, the system where they transform from being attached to the land. So here there's this more natural curve, and then they lock into the system that uh, the columns regulate under them. So here's where the water is right now. Um, this is the, so when it changes from this more natural curve into this kind of uh, uh, systematic uh, in and out of the columns below, there's a change in material. So it reads that you're going from one system to the next. And here's uh, looking under that. Um, so also with the double-sidedness, um, you just get these surfaces where they're very uh, ornamented and pristine and clean, and then whereas the reverse, more natural side, uh, you could say it's structure, but um, it's very uh, robust and grotesque. Um, this is Gaudi's Casa uh, Vicente, and Gaudi does this a lot in his work where um, people really start to uh, make the corner of the building an important aspect. So uh, you can see it's going from kind of a corner or a line into more of a surface condition and then transforms into a ball. Um, this happens a lot in Barcelona. So it's a really nice way to uh, make a transformation just by using surface. There's a lot of these uh, lights in Barcelona that uh, take advantage of creating uh, seating, and also planters that do this, uh, where the surface bulges out, so there's like an excess of surface that blends into another use, so it's dually used. This is just another little thing in uh, Gaudi's well house is down by the stable. Where you can see uh, the arches start to, or the surface between the arches uh, begins to change. This is a little uh, surface uh, wing with uh, some drainage, so uh, the space between begins to be carved away to allow other uh, systems to be a part of that space. Um, these were just little things we saw that we liked. This is um, the Trivi Fountain in Rome. This is from the street side. So on the street side, uh, you get this uh, kind of plant or base or carved out thing. Uh, and on the, opposed to the other side, you get this more robust, grotesque uh, um, stone that is more a part of the Trivi Fountain. So the surface kind of negotiates both sides of uh, that space. And this was another little interesting thing we saw in Rome, uh, in northern Rome, where we were approaching this obelisk, and this building actually like, carves back to allow uh, the sidewalk to pass through, but also this view uh, to the obelisk. And you could almost say that the obelisk is completing the edge of that building coming down to the sidewalk. So that was something we thought was cool. Um, and this is in Villa Julia. This is just a corner condition where uh, basically throughout the corner, these two columns just kind of collide. Um, and I would imagine in, in uh, like an axonometric view that uh, the column capital was, you would see, it would be like, it would be a perfect circle where these things intersect. So. Um, and then finally, this was in the courtyard of uh, uh, San Borneo San Ivo. And we didn't really know what it was. It was just this weird thing we thought it was a room. But uh, closer look, you can see it's a uh, palm capital that's like half face. But then that face, the other side of it, uh, kind of reads as a profile of a Corinthian palm capital. Um, so that is. It, um, so our, uh, we 
thought this was important because uh, just the skin and architecture now is so thin and we think that's an important thing that surface can be dual use and becomes a thicker thing. So thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ian McKay, and uh, thanks for coming today. I'm going to talk about uh, my trip to Shanghai. This isn't so much uh, an essay about Shanghai as it is about Westerners, uh, myself included, uh, understanding of it. Um, so when I was researching uh, things I could potentially um, study while in Shanghai, I kept on encountering uh, Western writing about it that, that characterized it as a city of the future, or the city of tomorrow. Um, it looks like the future. Uh, now, this is kind of an odd statement, n not just because Paris Hilton said it. Uh, we don't know what the future looks like, so it's kind of weird to say that something looks like it. Um, really, it's a myth, and it's one that's you know, fairly commonly applied to cities. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about one of those, uh, that's Los Angeles. So, um, post-war Los Angeles kind of embodied this you know, progressive, utopian, jet-age vision of the future. You saw it in the, the kind of aesthetics, the big mega-infrastructures that were being built. Uh, this is the restaurant at LAX. Uh, this summer, I went to uh, an exhibit at the Getty Center that, that explored this called um, called Overdrive. Um, according to uh, Mike Davis in City of Courts, this uh, vision was backed by the city's elites, so the, the big powers in LA, and he dubs it uh, boosters. So um, Shanghai kind of uh, embodies similar characteristics. Um, if you Google Shanghai skyline, you're likely to come up with this image, which uh, depicts the explosive growth of the Pudong district uh, in just 20 years. Um, uh, the Bond movie Skyfall uh, kind of glorified um, this side of Shanghai. This is a kind of driving scene in these like crazy little highway, highway mega infrastructure things. You also have a, a kind of well-known uh, big infrastructure piece, the, the maglev train, which rockets passengers from the Pudong airport to the city in like, a very short time. I uh, didn't get a chance to ride it, unfortunately. Um, and in 2010, Shanghai hosted the World Expo, where um, lots of you know, new, crazy technologies were on display, and you know, there were all these fancy pavilions that got built in. Uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, I feel like, is associated with the future just because it's like lit up really cool. <laughs> uh, short side note, this is Haibao. He is the 2010 World Expo mascot. And uh, he is described by the World Expo website as a baby creature from the sea who has magical powers to become a robot. Um, I just wanted to talk about him because I think he's really funny. Often appears in multiples. Uh, these are three high bows. Okay, uh, back to business. So um, Shanghai is often compared to Blade Runner, and one of those reasons, or one of the reasons for that, I believe, is is because the skylines are kind of you could say are similar, but I think there's actually a little bit more to it, and I'd like to read into it. Now, this is a depiction of the dystopian LA future uh, in Blade Runner. Um, so Blade Runner is based on a story by Philip K. Dick. Uh, he was writing science fiction in the 60s and 70s that was um, informed by uh, Noir, which is uh, kind of what Mike Davis calls the only, one of the few original cultural pr products of, of LA. You know Noir, it's that kind of hard-boiled, dark, uh, detective style genre. Um, so I, I would argue that uh, the, the version of the future uh, that Dick often depicts in, in his writing can actually be considered uh, kind of an anti-myth to that uh, utopian, futuristic vision of, of the post-war Los Angeles. 
Um, there's three uh, kind of common themes that I'd like to emphasize that often appear in, in um, Dick's stories, uh, including um, Blade Runner. Uh, skepticism of new technology as opposed to the celebration of it in that kind of utopian futuristic vision. Uh, paranoid regarding centralized, paranoia regarding centralized power and the psychological impact of uh, uh, the loss of personal agency and creativity and the consequent powerlessness that his characters often feel. That's kind of the common situation of his protagonists. Um, Dick is often considered kind of a progenitor to the cyberpunk genre. Um, now, cyberpunk is often pegged as starting with this novel. It's called Neuromancer by William Gibson. William Gibson is a writer who coined the term cyberspace. Um, so it generally often has the same kind of noirish atmosphere that Dick's writing does, same kind of dystopian future, marginalized loners kind of hacking out and existence and it's these big kind of usually huge multinational corporate powers or kind of governments, and that's the case in Neuromancer. It's kind of about a, a hacker who gets wrapped up in this mess. Um, you all probably recognize those themes just because cyberpunk has come to inform kind of a lot of films and books and other things. It's become very persuasive. One of the most famous instances is The Matrix, um, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Also, things like Terminator and the aforementioned Blade Runner. So the hero is often the hacker. This is someone who can, uh, kind of within the seams of this big power structure, um, you know, kind of wield his or her ingenuity, um, take what he's got and work with it and build something um, kind of new that, that does something um, creative. Um, so I was looking for this in Shanghai. And uh, uh, or I should say first that um, I think that this is the vision that has colored uh, our view of the future. And when people describe, Westerners describe Shanghai as a, as a city of the future, I think this is kind of the vision that they're generally referring to. Um, you know, you've got the, the glittering infrastructure and, and kind of big shiny buildings that I, that I just uh, showed you a few moments ago, as well as, you know, the communist government, which is, you know, the centralized state, the big power, uh, in the room that, that we love to kind of think about as, as maybe having more intentions. Okay, so uh, I go to Shanghai uh, looking for how this actually plays out on the ground, and I see, you know, these big tower blocks. Uh, they're, they're kind of, they're replacing the, the smaller uh, vernacular uh, architecture of the, the lane house. Um, you're also getting really weird plan communities like this one, it's called Tamestown. Uh, it's uh, basically empty um, except for people taking wedding photographs. So it's a great <laughs> backdrop for that. Uh, here's the sign. There's several other of these uh, kind of new towns in Shanghai that are based on like a Dutch uh, way of town planning and, and, and design, uh, Italian, German, and so forth. Um, and it strikes Westerners, I think, as something straight out of the Matrix. Like, this is the Matrix designed by machines. They're like, what do these humans want? Let's give them you know, the perfect little British town. Um, but anyway, uh, what I, I came to see so much more often when I was in Shanghai is uh, crazy just you know, scenes on the street. And this is kind of how that plays out, just madness. Uh, not much rules being, not many rules being followed. Um, so, um, and what I what I really came to get interested in is is this kind of the, how um, the people in Shanghai have, have kind of started to use their streets and, and the, the tools that kind of show up and dominate it. Uh, this is my hierarchy of, of order on Shanghai streets. Um, contrary to my, what you might think, I, I think scooters are at the top of, of the list. They seem to do whatever they want. They will drive absolutely anywhere, you know, sidewalk, road, like up onto a kind of elevated walkway. Um, cars and trucks and buses are actually more unique. Uh, they tend to stick to the road, although not always. Um, you know, bikes, you're at the, you're at the mercy of, of the larger vehicles and pedestrians. And then I, I should have even put below that American tourists are kind of like totally, totally just at the whims of everyone else. But um, yeah, funnily enough, scooters seem to like really capture my attention. Um, 
So um, I got this book while I was in Shanghai called Chinese Junks and Other Native Craft, and it was written, I think, at the like, turn of the 20th century by this European guy who really just got interested in, in these, these kind of native boats and all the, the kind of weird, interesting things that their owners used them, you know, did to them to, to be able to perform their tasks better. And it, they just, uh, his depictions of them, he celebrated them so much, it, it kind of just struck me as a, as a good parallel to what I was starting to think about with the scooters. So I kind of have, have started to do the same thing. Um, I think that uh, what you see on scooters in Shanghai, you know, oftentimes it's just like one person riding, you know, those weird oven mitt things that uh, the handlebars are equipped with to like protect their hands. Um, sometimes there's also like an umbrella or something added on. So you get all these little like tricked out things, but they're purely functional. It's not like in Western culture people kind of tricking out a car. Um, you, you know, you, you get the kitty carrier, you get kids in there, sometimes whole families on this one little rinky dink machine. Um, and what's funny is I think that unlike a car, you can see everything that the scooter is carrying. You can see how it's set up. And um, the cargo, whether it be people or other things, tends to get situated the same way. Cause I don't know if, how many of you guys have uh, ridden a two-wheeled uh, bicycle or scooter, but balance is a big issue. And once you start loading it up with lots of stuff, it becomes really, really hard to ride. Especially, think about that street scene I showed you, how crazy that was. So, I mean, I saw some really wild stuff. There was seriously a guy carting around a refrigerator, and I, you know, you get these weird things like going on. I came to think, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> what I saw, you know, they're capable of anything. So uh, that's the end, and the reason uh, I think this is important um, is I think that it, it shows a it shows a kind of that Shanghai is a cyberpunk city, maybe not in the way you you initially thought when I said that, but it, you kind of have this hopeful uh, hacking culture where the regular people in the city are constantly kind of toying uh, with what they've got, making it work, and that adds a adds a lot of richness. You know, the disciplines in this building. Uh, we're kind of usually on the other side of the table. We're at the, the kind of big design, the big infrastructure, the big buildings and stuff. But I think it's important for us to remember that these people are out here and they're designers too. And, uh, you know, we're the better for them being out there. Thank you very much.